Well, just moving straight on. Um, so, uh, use, using the techniques for sh proving closure of uh, regular languages under the operations of union, intersection, and complement, use, use those techniques to help you construct uh, this new DFA, call it C, uh, using um, the two DFAs A and B. So, uh, so assume that you've constructed it, and you know you'd have your chewing machine do all this, of course. So this is very much a high-level uh, description. Uh, you know, just just how you do all that. You know, that's sort of swept under the carpet, so to speak. Okay, now, uh, so then, yeah, once, once you've got that C, uh, you can then uh, use the previous theorem, uh, which was 4.4, we're, we're, we're now proving theorem 4.5, the next one. So, so just use the previous theorem, that was on, uh, so 4.4, was on page 170, it is on page 170 of your text, okay, uh, and to, uh, to test whether um, the language recognized by uh, this D of A, C, you know, L of C, is it empty? Okay? That's, that's what this theorem was about. It was uh, showing that uh, that empty language is uh, decidable. So you can use, you can use that theorem to, to see whether L of C is empty. Now, if it is, if it is empty, well, therefore you know that these two uh, DFAs are equivalent because you know, they do the same job, they, they recognize the same language. You know, LA equals LB, right? two languages are the same. Okay, so that's the what, proof idea? No, that's still part of the proof, right? Well, okay, now we go on to the formal, uh, well, the standard, the description of the Turing machine at high level, of course, as always. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how do we implement this at low level? For, forget about it. Um, so, yeah, a high level description of uh, the, the Turing machine. So, uh, as you know, I, I tend to forget the final double quote. Okay, so, uh, so we're going to create a Turing machine F, and we'll show uh, that. Uh, the language is decidable, which is what? Uh, it, it was EQ suffix. You know, go, go to the, the bottom of the of square three, in other words, the first square of the second session, the left, the left square of the second session, the previous, previous session. Uh, so it's EQ suffix I'm looking at the moment, DFA. So we'll find a, a two machine that decides that language and hence uh, you know indirectly uh, enable us to show if these two languages are the same and hence if these two DFAs are equivalent maybe. Alright, so uh, as usual, so let F be that Turing machine that, that we're constructing, so construction, proof by construction and as usual we first talk about the input string, so the input string is an encoded form you know, string the information about the two DFAs A and B. You know, two random DFAs. Uh, so here you have the encoded information about, like the formal descriptions. Uh, you know, they're fi each the five tuples of those two machines, if you like, with all their transition rules, blah blah blah. Okay, A and B. Where A and B are DFAs, right? Uh, so the various stages, each numbered. So uh, construct your new machine DFA C as described. Uh, hand wavy, very woolly. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as, as mentioned uh, a bit here in the previous previous session. Okay. So in, in other words, you know, use your machines A and B. Uh, use the symmetric uh, difference formula, etc., etc. Okay. So you, you you now have your machine C, right? Well. Um, 
So then uh, you, you can run this machine T. Now T is the Turing machine from Theorem 4.4. Right, the one that tests with a, uh, a machine um, recognizes zero strings. Okay? Uh, that was theorem. Yeah, it was just the previous theorem, in other words, on, on page 170. Same. Yeah. Okay? Uh, on, on, the, on the input, well, uh, so your machine out of C right, is. Uh, so for this machine, does it uh, generate zero strings? That's, that's what you're asking. So if your T machine, you know, from the previous theorem, uh, if, if T accepts, we'll then have F accept. Okay? And if T uh, rejects, we'll then have F reject. And that way uh, you show that uh, your machine C, uh, its language, L of C, um, is empty. Yeah, it's just an empty set. And uh, if L of C is empty, then L of A equals L of B from, from your, the logic you used uh, with the symmetric difference. Okay? Next, uh, so you know, double bar, so the next uh, big topic. Now, um, now, now we're going to talk about decidable problems. We're going to do the same kind of thing that we've done for, what, five, five theorems? That um, that we're doing with regular languages, and now we're going to do much the same with uh, context-free languages. You know, sort of moving on. Uh, remember, chapter one was about regular languages. They're, they're a rather limited uh, class of languages. Um, and then in chapter two, we uh, talked about context-free languages. And regular languages are a subset of context-free languages. So, context-free languages are sort of broader class of languages. So now, now we're going to talk about problems, you know, computational type problems, computational type questions about context-free languages. Okay? So we're going to do much the same kind of thing as we did before, before we we're, were dealing with um, regular languages. Now we're going to ask similar questions uh, about context-free languages, but we'll, we'll keep using that same trick of converting a computational problem into a belongs to a language type problem. Right? So yeah, we're doing this sort of trick again. But uh, the this here, well, this it's not a machine now. It uh, tends to be. Well, now we're going to talk about we're talking context-free languages, so we're going to be talking about grammars. So this, so that's why it's a G here rather than an M or something. It's not a machine, it's a grammar. But we're going to convert to machines anyway, so not that it makes sense. Yeah, there's all this conversion going on, right? Okay, so question. This is a computational type question. You're given a, a context-free grammar, okay, a C of G, and you asked, can this grammar generate a particular string? So that, that's the question, that's the problem. Given an arbitrary grammar, given an arbitrary string, uh, is there an algorithm that can decide, yes or no, whether this arbitrary grammar can generate this arbitrary string? Right? It's, uh, it's much the same kind of problem that we've done before. So I hope you're fairly familiar with it. So I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Okay, so again, you know, convert that problem into a belong to a language type problem. Here's, here's your language. Again, I'm just A with suffix CFG this time, context-free grammar. Because now we're talking about uh, context-free languages. And re remember, uh, definition of context-free language. It's, uh, it's the language of all strings generated by the grammar. Okay, uh, so here's your um, k-tuple, or, or two-tuple, or pair, ordered pair, uh, where g, that's your grammar, you're just some random uh, context-free grammar, uh, c of g, and w is some string. And uh, this ordered pair is a member of your set if... Uh, this 
this grammar here can generate this string. Okay? And that we call that language, we will find a Turing machine that uh, decides that language. Right? And uh, so then the problem, you know, does this grammar generate this uh, string? That problem boils down to uh, ask, you know, trying to find out whether this pair, you know, for a, a given grammar, or an, or an, an arbitrary grammar, CFG, 